uh, one of Riley's friends' uh, parents had a barbecue. And we went over there. They lived two streets over. And, you know, they're dating us, right? Because we we're, you know, like they're the parents who was our age. You know, I get what you mean. You know, they're dating us here. And I show up and this guy, big old belly, our age, covered in tattoos, just shirtless, just no shame. I'm just like, this guy's my hero. I mean, I can't do that in a pool. Like, I have to wear something. So right. just this guy just doesn't care. Let it all hang out. And I was jealous. And then um, he goes, hey, you want to help me get the food ready for the barbecue? And I was like, yeah. So uh, I go into the kitchen, and he's just just fingering the chicken, just raw chicken, just fingering it. I'm just like, what are you doing? He's just like, nothing, just get in the chicken. And then he doesn't wash his hands, and he goes to the brats and just fingers the brats. Oh. I'm just like, oh, my God, what do I do? Hello, and thank you very much for downloading this most recent episode of Movie Guys Podcast. You can download many more episodes at movieguyspodcast.podbean.com. We are back, baby. We are back again with our buddies comedy retrospective series. I'm excited. Uh, this was Eric's idea. And we decided that we were, since him and I are buddies, and Eric's now, now, well, Sarah's now a bud. But anyway, we're going to do a buddies nostalgia movie. There's rules to this, but the first movie we're going to review today is probably one of my favorite buddy comedies, Lethal Weapon. Eric, how the hell are you doing? It's the ultimate buddy comedy, right? Well, I wouldn't say it was a comedy at first, but it has then through uh, pop culture and everything, turned in into that. But uh, for someone who was the first time watching it, Sarah, did you think this was more of a comedy <coughs> comedy or an action? Excuse me. Uh, I felt it was more of an action movie. Um, having seen, you know, a fair number of 80s uh, drug movies, um, you know, it felt more like an action movie to me than a, a comedy, but definitely a buddy movie. You know, by the end of the movie, they're sharing a beer and Christmas mm-hmm. dinner. Um <laughs> Also, if you hear some some tiny sounds in the background, we have an extra special guest today. Uh, our baby is joining us. She's two months old, and please excuse her her tiny sounds. <laughs> the dedication. I, I truly thought that you were going to take like half a year off of podcasting. So two months later, baby's first podcast. She is Here. strapped to me, and yep, she is joining us today. Right. She watches a lot of the movies with us as, as well. Uh, yeah, so Lethal Weapon was huge uh, for me. Uh, I started watching it uh, when I was 14, right? It was on USA, TNT all the time, TBS, the Superstation. Uh, the first one was on all the time. I even went out and got the box set. Yes, there was a box set, right? Um, I was big into Lethal Weapon. Eric, were you as big into Lethal Weapon for that young teenage boy era like i was so my really. first exposure to lethal weapon was in that era of the tv movie the heavily censored melon farmer tv movie era and right. what i what i mean by that is uh the reruns that they would uh, uh have like die hard and lethal weapon these these uh very classic kind of action movies that would play uh, at the late hour of a basic cable broadcast but they would bleep out or not bleep but they would just either completely censor or dub over the swear words and right. this was one of those movies you know, so yes. you would hear something like oh go fix yourself kind of a <laughs> something <laughs> something amongst those lines and yeah this was definitely one of those heavily edited it's always nice though i got to rewatch this in its natural form i guess we'll call it we'll call it that and just to, to really be like, oh, this is what I missed. Not much. A few boobs. Not much. A lot of <laughs> F words. And there was there was so many boobs. Wow. It opened up with boobs, and I was very surprised. I could see yeah. A 13-year-old yeah. girl would love this movie. I didn't see this. I mean, I, I was this, this was heavily censored, too, until I got the DVDs. And I will add a little bit of spice to your uh, go fix yourself comment. Uh, Murtaugh in this movie says when he gets beat up, go spit. He says that. And I'm watching the, you know, edited movie on TV. He's like, oh, that's just, you know, go, go something else, you know, but no, he literally says, go spit. I don't know. He's a family man. But I don't know what that means. Oh, no, no idea. It was the 80s. I don't know. I'm not going to try to, yeah, 
interpret that slang. Go fly right. a kite, maybe go go suck an egg. Right. Uh, Shane Black, who has directed a few movies here in the in the in the present, uh, wrote this movie. This movie was originally really, really extremely dark, and uh, they wrote a sequel. And the sequel was Mel Gibson getting killed at the end. So they Richard Donner, who took this over, right, who's directed all four movies, said it was too dark of a script. They needed to change some things. But the only thing that Shane Black said that he could not change was this opening suicide scene because it gave the movie weight. I don't see it gave it weight. It's just a, it's just a coked out chick jumping out of a, jumping out of a building. You know, it happens every Sunday in L.A. Yeah, I still don't understand a whole lot of it, but when Richard Donner starts talking, you listen. I mean, yes. I mean, it's a legend, legendary director. Right. So let's go ahead and just cut into it, right, before we get into the uh, big plot of it. But this girl jumps off a balcony. She thinks she can fly kind of thing, probably, because she was sniffing cocaine that was laced with, like, arsenic, some poison. Yeah, yeah, some, some sort of killer. And that was by accident, or was that the Vietnam drug dealers uh, did that on purpose to cut the cocaine? They find that later on it was on purpose, right? This is where I I had to really pay attention to this story, because before I was not paying attention to any story. It was just good guys go after bad guys. That's what that was. Right. So, yeah, uh, that's all what we were thinking. Okay. But, so, the... Because that's the thing, because I wanted to rewatch it again. So the Vietnam drug lords purposely got the fresh cocaine, cut it, and put this poison arsenic in it on purpose. Or was it the actual no. dude that she was doing cocaine with? I, I had thought that based, the overall story basically was that Murtaugh's buddy from, from right. Vietnam got, right. in, got into some stuff with some shadow ops guys doing right the heroin trade oh heroin while yes. while they were doing that over there and uh, since the war had ended he his more talks buddy had continued the trade fast forward to now the future of the 80s 87 and the mercenary group has caught wind of of this and they want to take over that action and so uh, i thought that they basically were trying to um Threaten the connects, if you yeah, will. Yeah, threaten, bribe. Yeah, and so right. that this this one girl who died like this was the daughter of the middleman. So it was a hit. It was it was a hit. So they could send a message. I think uh, yeah. If you want to say it was a hit, more of a yeah, uh, yeah kind of a mark. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this, right? So let's talk, uh, let's talk about it. Sarah was here last, well, this year, technically, but for our last retrospective, uh, we told her when we did Last Action Hero, we kind of had an idea that we were going to do this, and we we're like, you're going to see the tropes, right? So, Sarah, did you actually see the tropes from Last Action Hero to the actual source material? Uh, you know, I did not even remember uh, that you said that. <laughs> Um, I am in a haze. I watched this movie uh, in like five different sections over the course of an afternoon while nursing, uh, nap time, etc. So right. um, I was not paying attention to that portion. Okay. I do remember seeing, I think I've seen some of this on TV. There right. were some scenes that seemed familiar to me. Um, but I mean, it, like, again, it's an 80s action movie. Like, they all have the same trope for Last Action Hero to be playing off of that is, I don't know, it seems pretty standard. I don't know. I think this is the 80s action movie. I feel movie. like this is the, the, the one. Actually, I feel like it was such, this movie was such played off, or so played off of later on, that while re-watching this one, I feel like this right. was the parody. Yeah, <laughs> right. But there's a parody, Sarah, if you ever want to watch it. National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1. With Emilio Stop. Estevez? Emilio Estevez is Mel Gibson. And uh, one of the Waynes is uh, Murtaugh. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I do. Can we talk about Mel Gibson? Yeah, let's talk about Mel Gibson. So I was curious because Danny Glover uh, is supposedly turning 50 in this movie. Yeah. Um, I was curious, how old was Danny Glover actually in this movie? Do you know? 
Uh, was he in his 40s? He was 40 playing a 50 year old. And then Mel Gibson was only 31. We're closer in age to uh, Danny Glover than we are to Mel Gibson in this movie. I know, right? And know what's really sad too is it doesn't make any sense because like Vietnam was what, 68 ish through like 73? Like it was around that period, right? Yeah, so how did Mel, because Mel Gibson said that he served, right? Because he's got the tattoo. Right, he served, and he was, like, one of the deadliest snipers in Vietnam. It's like, wait a minute, his age doesn't make exactly. sense. Exactly, right. Because he would be 50. No, yeah, he would be. Yeah, he should be older if right. he served in Vietnam, even if right. he was 18. And then what Mur- wait, Murtaugh did serve in Vietnam, because he said that um, the girl's dad who, yeah, he was his army buddy. So, okay, let's talk about Murtaugh and, Mel- <laughs> and and Riggs. Let's talk about Murtaugh and Riggs. Let's talk about Murtaugh first. I, I would also I, like to point yeah. out that Jordan knows the actual characters' names in this movie. Every other movie, he refers to them by the actors' names. Uh, the reason why that is is because this movie's great. Um, and when I love something, I, I, I give my full uh, mm-hmm. uh, attention. No. He also pronounces everybody's names correctly. Of course. Yes, because I've seen it a thousand. If we watch Terminator 2, that's not Linda Hamilton. That's Sarah Connor. Okay? Anyway. <laughs> but it's also 8.30 in the morning. Uh, so It's a different kind of Jordan here. It's a different kind of Jordan. There is no alcohol in Jordan right now. So um, let's talk about Murtaugh and Riggs, but I want to talk about Murtaugh first. Uh, I know L.A. is a kooky town. I know L.A. is different than our neck of the woods of Midwestern. But uh, Murtaugh is a detective, right? Yeah. Like, that's his title? How? What does his wife do? That house. A detective. Come on. That house is amazing. I love that house. It was uh, a different time back then. It was 87, you know? Yeah, definitely a different time. Different time where a man can't take a bath because his wife comes in. And three and she children. Puts a, Teenage and three children. children. Yeah, that's the problem, right? Because like yeah. she puts a little towel over his bits. Just, just a little Did bit. She? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. She puts a little towel down to cover oh. it. No, I have different. questions about that. I didn't remember seeing that. Right. He's taking a bubble bath in the morning. What police detective As a 50-year-old right, man. takes a bubble bath in the morning, right? Now, I understand having little kids come into the bathtub and say, Daddy, happy birthday, and accidentally spill the cake in the tub, and we get a laugh about it, right? No, these are these are grown kids. That's so weird. It's a loving family moment, man. He's That's too old to for this shit. Yes, he's too old. And we're a lot of swear on this episode because he says that. Yep. That's, that's the good thing. I'm not going to swear that one or uh, bleep that, that swear out. That's just because he's, it's part of the quote. It's what it's – I was how or that's how I was supposed to say it. That, that's where we are. Here we go. Uh, he's too old for the spit. Hey, uh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, so what's it? His daughter says, I think you should shave your beard, Dad. You're getting old. Goes downstairs. He has his mustache. Now we get the Murtal look. Then – we cut from there. We go to Mel Gibson's butt, right? Woo. That was a whole lot of Mel Gibson butt. Can I say that I'm jealous of Mel Gibson, not of his butt, but I'm jealous of, but I'm jealous of his living situation. The reason why I'm jealous of his living situation, he has oceanfront view and a trailer. You know how much that probably is worth in, in California. Lot. Oh, come on. Because you know they bulldoze that nowadays, right? There's like luxurious apartments and stuff probably. Like, what a great view. This guy's living the bachelor life. His wife died, what, six months prior to this movie in a car accident. Right. Right? Now, was it my memory serving me wrong or was it just uh, me wrong or me right? But did we find out in this movie, the sequel, that she actually was pregnant? That's going to be the sequel. That was the sequel. So this movie, they do not say that. Okay. Because the sequel, we find out that she was pregnant. Of course. You know, she, and then of course the bad guy was the guy that killed his wife. Um, So we get an old cop who's 40, who we're closer to the age of, and we get a young renegade cop who is suicidal. Who's 35. An old 40 year old cop and a young 35 year old cop. He's actually right. 50, He's 50. 50 year old yeah. cop and a young 45 yeah, year old. Yeah, they're celebrating cop. his 50th birthday. So, now of course, the 80s being the 80s and the 2020s being the 2020s here, we're comparing apples and oranges. Um, Mel Gibson would not be 
would not be a detective at this day and age, right? I mean, like, they would not allow him to be on the job. I don't think Murtaugh would be a detective <laughs> either, <laughs> to be honest with you. That's just... It's just the things that he does is crazy because what it's Christmas time, right? So we're in a so we're in a tree farm and uh, Riggs is uh, trying out the cocaine, trying to be a drug dealer. This part is funny where he's like, "I want to buy all of it," and he's like, "How much?" And he's like, "Okay," so he's counting ones. Mm-hmm. He's like, "A hundred and fifty thousand dollars." He's like, "I don't have that much." Like I thought that was kind of fun. It's clever to get um, the get the the number. Said right, out loud, right? right? T- kind of a, a tactic, and it just shows that he's uh, his tactics are a bit uh, unusual, but uh, and maybe off the book, we'll say. He's not a regular cop. He's a cool cop. But he gets it well, done. He's good police. So there's a couple of scenes I want to talk about. That. I don't know if you guys seen. So did you guys get the director's cut, or did you? Okay, so you seen the school shooting scene. No. Well, wait, the DVD said it was, yeah, we rented it or borrowed a DVD from the library. That's how we watched this. It okay. said director's cut on it, but I so don't there, remember that scene. So there's a school shooting scene. It's either before or after the tree farm scene where, yes. okay. Yes. That there's scene a sniper was, who's shooting at the kids. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he misses Mel Gibson. Yeah. yeah. That scene was cut from the actual movie that was released in theaters. So uh, I was curious if you guys thought that. You agree that should be cut nowadays, or should it not? Um, I, I mean, think it actually should be cut because it kind of takes it out, right? Oh, I didn't see a problem with it. I think it introduces Mel Gibson initially as that renegade. You know, he's he's not going to play by the book, um, and you don't actually see any kids get shot. So, um, no, well, I'm I not. Don't. He's a cop with nothing to lose. No, I'm not saying that the. I'm not saying that the. Uh, that the scene itself bothers me. It bothers me because um, the reason why they cut it, in my opinion, is because it's because they're introduced in the character twice. Because we get him at the tree farm. We're seeing that he's a renegade cop doing the doing the three stooges, you know, and everything to the drug dealers and being crazy and wacky. And then it goes to the sniper and the kids. It's like there's no reason to have two of the same sh- scenes, essentially. I um, prefer the school shooting scene. Just because it, it, it was a bit more intense. His tree farm had a more of his character in it, but that school shooting scene, coming from the scenes before uh, of him being tormented, I guess, in his bachelor pad with pictures of his dead wife, it let me know that, oh, this guy really is serious. It does not care if he, if he lives or dies or not. He's just going to do whatever he can just because, well, screw it. Does Mel Fix Gibson, it. does he go too crazy as the character? I mean, like, is it so crazy that it's not believable? Or do you think, as Eric, you and I have seen the sequels, or do you think this is the most toned down rigs? Oh, believability is nothing to do with this movie. It, that we're, we're out of that. That's uh, we're out of that. <laughs> two, two cops <laughs> doing all this in, in L.A. This is, this is so Shane Black, I don't even know uh, how to describe it. should be its own category. He's Because uh, he's the thing about the last action hero. He has to do, like, uh, kiss, kiss, bang, bang. He did uh, the other Lethal Weapons. Right. Nice guys. Yeah, he did Nice Guys, which is a, a well, a buddy comedy movie in L.A. Right. About a missing tell girl. The, tell that you have a low compound fracture. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a great movie, though. By the way. Yeah. Another question. This is an honest question. I'm glad because I've never had a chance to review Lethal Weapons, so I'm trying to get all these thoughts that I've been waiting to talk about for a long time. Does Riggs and Murtaugh get put together because really people don't like Murtaugh? Because Murtaugh's supposed to play this 50-year-old with a gray beard, and he has this fancy life. He, he, he kind of dresses fancier compared to other detectives, right? And it's just like he's talking to a buddy. Murtaugh's talking to a buddy, and he sees Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson's wearing a hat, and Danny Glover profiles him and thinks he's a bad guy. And he pulls out his gun, and he's like, hey, Murtaugh, meet your new partner. It's like, why did they put these two together? I That's a legitimate question. Like, was there a reason to something that I missed? Like, or is it they just don't like Murtaugh and they're like, hey, or they don't like Riggs? I don't know. I think they don't like Riggs that the the psychiatrist was saying, you know, he's a danger and all those kinds of things. So maybe they're putting Riggs with Murtaugh because Murtaugh is sort of the level headed, bless you, um, level headed, you know, older cop. Um, 
and he's supposed to help Riggs kind of get back into normalcy. He, he, he well, then when he does it, then in the sequels, technically, Eric, do you agree with her? Oh yeah, I would say Riggs definitely tones down the crazy as the movies per- progress. The situations though amp up a little bit more because then Murtaugh gets a little crazier and. He always he always seems to be the punching bag, though. He was. Uh, he would uh, towards the ending of the sh- episode here. I, mean, I don't know if Sarah's seen any of the other ones. We got to talk about some big scenes just so she can understand how crazy it gets. And the then toilet. Chris Rock comes in, and Joe Pesci, and a toilet. Um, so they go to this other drug dealer's house, and this is where we get the pool fight. Uh, that scene's always fun to me, right? Where they choke the guy out of the pool. But so the big so now we get the drug dealers to where we have Gary Busey and his beautiful horse teeth, and he's Mister Nobody. No, is he Mister Nobody or is that something that's making up? No, well, Mister Josh- Joshua. Mister Joshua. Mister Joshua. What a great villain name! It's- uh, he's oh. obviously a bad guy because he has a first name as a last name. Yeah, yeah, and he has and he has the blonde hair and the big teeth, and his name's Mister Joshua. Come on, Eric, this guy's great. Oh, of course. He's a great general to to fight. He is. He's a great villain to fight. They needed just him, right? We shouldn't have gotten... Uh, well, because you have Mitchell Ryan as the... Uh, as the uh, Peter McAllister. Uh, uh, that's the, the guy, right? The general? Yeah, but I don't want him in here, though. I mean, like... He's the, the guy calling the shots, which was kind of... I don't know, lame, but I understand that yeah. the purpose of like it had the big bad to boss someone like Mr. Joshua around. Right, but I don't want that though. Mr. Joshua should have made all the decisions, or maybe the big boss was somebody they would never see because that character no reason being it. Because the only time he served a, not really a purpose was when he was meeting with a drug dealer in the club with a very terrible poison cover band or a Motley Crue cover band. He's like, Mr. Joshua, your arm, and gets a lighter in. Mr. Joshua burns himself to show loyalty. I. Uh, it was a weird I'm scene. I'm a badass. Yeah, I don't know. It's nobody likes Palpatine. Everyone likes Vader. So, kind of sums, actually, sums that up right there. I guess so. I just didn't care for it. So now the two are teaming up, Riggs and Marta, and they are slowly trying to uncover the death of Murtaugh's old army buddy's friend's daughter. Um. Another thing that Egg I want to bring up. We got a... The eggnog scene. Yeah, oh, yeah, the best scene of the whole movie where oh. uh, that guy gets shot through the window and then through the front of his body and then through the, the carton of eggnog. Oh, that was toward, yeah, that was like towards the middle. I was going to talk about the suicide jump scene when Riggs takes the guy and jumps off the building with, but okay. Yeah, I mean, the the, the eggnog scene is great. That's, um, God, I've seen that. There's that much to talk about there. We just wanted to, to bring it up. Okay. It just I got a laugh out of me. That, yeah, that's course. the effect it's instead so of it being instead of it being a blood you know, uh, a pellet or something like that, that pops through the the shirt to kill a the guy they Is that <laughs> what makes it a comedy? You know, eggnog uh, at Christmas time? No, no, because this one's not a comedy, right? And if I said it was a comedy, I was miss No, it's uh it's a Christmas it's, movie. They were yeah. I was waiting. I was right, going about, going by the, the rules Christmas of the I mean, of the internet. I'm gonna say it is, but that's me. Who say that go everyone down. says that Die Hard is a Christmas movie? They have to now accept. Yeah. I just saw an interview with Bruce Willis, and he says Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. Bruce Willis has dementia. Um, so for dementia, <laughs> pre-dementia, Bruce Willis. He said it. He said those things. Uh, <laughs> um. Okay, another controversial thing. So we talked about introducing rigs, right? We talked about uh, the sniper school shooting scene and the tree farm scene. Do you think the movie could have been better if we would have cut those two scenes out and have Riggs' introduction be this suicide jumping off a building helper guy? Because this was crazy, too. He's like, he handcuffs him, you know, he's like, hey, do you really want to jump? Do you really want to? You know, and then he jumps, you know, and I, I don't know. I just, I... I think that this scene really, really spells out Riggs a lot. I think the Christmas tree scene adds the element of comedy. The school scene adds the element of, uh, you know, L.A. cop movie. And then you kind of get into the movie 
with the suicide jumper uh, because now he's been paired up with Murtaugh um, and we're kind of getting into the, the meat of the movie. Right. Right. Um, and this is where Murtaugh is like, you know, do you want to kill yourself? Do you actually want, he's like, I got a hollow point pin, whatever, uh, bullet with you know, blow my head off. So yeah, all this crazy stuff is going on. Um, what else? <laughs> so then <laughs> see their reactions up to it. Just Danny Glover, the way he's just the always yelling, just like, what's wrong with you, Riggs? It it just uh, maybe that's why I thought it was comedy. I've seen too many parodies of someone trying to do a Murtaugh that I'm actually seeing Murtaugh as like you know the the flanderized version of himself, and it's just a cartoon to me now. <laughs> but actually, here's the funny thing: so crazy uh, rigs. <laughs> do you want to die? Um, so I'm they gonna kick myself. Dota. Um. I, I identify with Murtaugh more in this now. When I saw this when I was 14, I was all rigs, right? But it's like, you know, Murtaugh plays it safe. Murtaugh's never, in my opinion, struck me as a guy who bended the rules. He always strikes me as a guy who yeah, was straight-laced. His tie was always really tight and straight. You know, he always played by the rules. It's by the book, man. By the book. By the book, get you the big house. You're a renegade. You get a, you get a trailer in a parking lot by the lotion. You know, like... It is. It's by the lotion. By the, can you by the by the what? By, by the, the ocean. ocean. But I said you. ocean. I, you ocean. said lotion. Uh, by the ocean. lotion. I'm We're sorry. We're not watching uh, Silence of the Lambs here. If I could, if I could <laughs> confess, I'm I'm drinking coffee at eight twenty in the morning. We don't really do podcasts this early, and also I have uh, a customer uh, that is emailing me already five times since eight thirty, and I'm trying to not. Um, lose my cool during the show <laughs> so i'm thinking about that thinking about this and thinking about this brown water called coffee excuses excuses what a saturday Very morning excuse. to be in here what a saturday morning and now it's cartoons excuse me sir so, we're talking about lethal weapon i'll get back to you in an hour so i want to know we get the title of the movie from murtaugh was that a grown moment where, like, where, like Riggs was like, oh, I do this stuff, and Murtaugh's like, oh, so all that kung fu stuff, I guess we classify you as the lethal weapon. So, yeah, no, that's kind of a groaner, right? I love when they say the title of the movie in the movie. Yeah. I mean, for this movie, though? Oh, yeah. I don't care. I thought it was fun. I thought it was kind of like an eye roller. It was just like, oh, stop it. We get a huge explosion, right? So now the two team up, find out that they have to go to Trixie's house. Trixie, and she, and Dixie. she does. Dixie. I thought it was Trixie. Dixie. Yeah. Dixie's well, getting busted or whatever the kids. Right. And so 80s, the random kid with the 3D glasses for yeah. no reason. They were like taped to his head too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, keep them on there. I actually, okay, so this is going to probably sound weird, but I actually kind of believe this interrogation, right? So the house blows up, big, huge explosion, right? And then Murtaugh and Riggs uh, interrogates, if you will, these these kids. And the way that uh, Murtaugh is talking to the kids and how the kids react, I totally, totally, totally believe it, right? Like, I totally believe it because the kid's like, oh, like uh, like uh, paint. He's painted. Oh, paint like a like a tattoo, like Popeye, you know, and stuff like that. I was like, oh, that's kind of believable. And then when the kid points to Murtaugh's um, uh, Riggs's Riggs, tattoo, I'm sorry, sorry, Riggs's tattoo. Riggs was like freaked out. He was like, that is a special forces tattoo. So we're dealing with special forces. It's like, come on, this is great. What the? What are all these special forces and? Uh, ex-military doing in L.A.? Uh, because it's L.A. and it's in the 80s. I mean, they're going to be in L.A. or New York. They're not going to be anywhere else. Well, they, they had to use the front of the one guy. So if his business is in L.A., I guess they're running drugs through L.A. There's also a port. You can import the drugs from uh, yeah. wherever mm. the drugs come from. Yeah, Vietnam, going mm -hmm. to L.A., yeah. right? Makes Easier. sense, yep. Going to easier, and this is where uh, we get that eggnog right scene going mm -hmm. through Joshua sniping, right? 
and then Murtaugh's daughter gets kidnapped. And then we get the, uh, uh, they got my daughter. So, you know, was it also after this is where um, Riggs was picking up uh, hookers? Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, so that he can go home and watch TV with them. Boop. How old are you? How old do you want me to be? Oh, God. <laughs> like, geez. Like, wow. And, um, what, and he well, says, like, what's a what's a nice Irish girl like you doing on the streets? And she's clearly Asian. <laughs> <laughs> what's a nice Australian doing trying to play a 31-year-old uh, L.A.? I, I wanted to look, and I didn't get a chance. Um, how long had Mel Gibson been acting in American movies at this point? Well, wasn't his was big... He well, was he well known? Yeah, so, like... Uh... Yeah, so like his uh, his big one would be Mad Max, but that was the first one was Australian. All the Mad Max movies are um, Australian, right, Eric? Uh, so he that... did Mad Max in '79. So okay, so Mad Max was an independent Australian film, and then he did the sequel, The Road Warrior, because Mad Max wasn't a hit, but The Road Warrior was a hit. That was 81, and then he did Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome in 85, and then this was the next movie he did. Right, um, yeah. Yeah, because I was just noticing, you know, at 31 years old, uh, his Australian accent peeks through quite a few times in this movie. Right, right. yeah. Um, he would have he would have been a big star because Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, he starred with Tina Turner. Oh. So that would, that would have been like a big, huge you know, get to get him in here. Um, we get the torture scenes of there. No, I'm sorry. Not yet. Riggs. Riggs is walking the streets. Bad guy shoots Riggs with a shotgun. Riggs is fine. Right. Cause he has a bulletproof vest on and it was a diversion. So they think that he is dead. Bertal then has to go to the desert to exchange. What where the drugs are. For his dog. Yeah, he has to tell Mr. Joshua what the guy, the eggnog guy, told him. Right. So we need information. We'll give you your daughter. And then Riggs is how many hundreds of yards away sniping people because he's the best shot. That's right. Of course he is. Right. And then we get a helicopter chase scene and Murtaugh's daughter driving a limousine. Um, does not get far. Does not no. get far. And then we get the torture scenes of... Uh, they're in a warehouse back in LA and Riggs is hanging up. And then that Asian guy that tortures Riggs yeah. is in every single eighties action movie. He was in, he was, he was, he in was last action hero. He was in last action heroes and henchmen. He was a henchman in die hard. Oh yeah. This guy, this guy works the circuit, if you will. Yeah. He's right? a, uh, he's a modern day Hector. Right. So they're going to electrocute rigs for um, well, knowledge, whereabouts of drugs, or what did he tell you? And then Murtaugh is telling people to go spit because they're rubbing, literally rubbing salt in his wounds. Yeah. Right. So Murtaugh's, <laughs> Murtaugh's getting hit pretty hard, but who do you think, he, but Riggs is getting electrocuted pretty bad too. Who do you think has it worse? Uh, I mean, like, electrocution stinks. But I would rather do that than Murtaugh because Murtaugh gets – he's getting punched in the face. <laughs> he's, getting, he's getting wrecked. He's getting punched in the face. He has cuts all over his arms. They're literally putting salt. And then, you know, he's screaming, go spit, go spit. <laughs> Just, I mean, right? No? I mean, you would rather be uh, – you'd rather be Murtaugh? I, I, I don't know, man. Getting shot is one thing, but getting electrocuted like that underneath the water might be another thing. Uh, or maybe it was just uh, Mel Gibson's acting that didn't really sell it too much. Mel Gibson decided to be all uh, all crazy, though, right? Because he, he grabs uh, – when the when Mr. Joshua leaves and the Asian guy is by himself, uh, he gets his feet and gets it around his neck, and he, and he chokes him out, and you hear that <laughs> crunch noise, you know? Yeah. yeah no, that could not happen, you know, like a WWE move. This no – that's not happening. Well, again, it's a it's a fun for things because I'm pretty sure when you get electrocuted, you don't flail around like that. You you seize. Well, I was waiting for us to get an X-ray vision of his skeleton. Like now, that would have made it a oh comedy, perfect. Right? Now I'm on board. Yeah, right. Um, and then we get craziness on top of craziness. Then we get uh, 
Riggs is so angry and so passionate and so motivated that he's going to sprint run after Mr. Joshua, who's driving down the L.A. highway, right? He does a lot of running and in here, more than Tom he does, a, he does a lot of running. And we finally uh, get to Murtaugh's house. And I've been waiting all podcasts to say this because I think it's the greatest line in the movie. Uh, where, what, what, somebody hits the fire hydrant, right? So there's water going everywhere, mm -hmm. right? And all these cops are around, and we get the floodlights of the helicopter. Like, this is not real, right? There's no way all these cops are going to make a ring, if you will. And <laughs> Rick says, how about it, Joshua? You want a shot at the title? I love it. That gets me hyped. No? <laughs> it's like, yeah! Yeah! So hyped. I was so hyped. I was so hyped. Every time he says it, you want a shot at the title? I was waiting for Mr. Joshua, Eric, to get this reference to go, dang, dang. Uh, <laughs> Jordan, the way we watch movies sometimes, I feel like I'm missing out on a whole lot. There's a part where this is happening on the couch, and I'm sitting there with my feet up, mouth open, trying to stay awake, <laughs> catching myself. And here's Jordan on two feet, just, just blood pressure peak. Just because it's screaming it's, it's to the ceiling and go, yeah. because because um, I I guess I'll sell it a little bit more. I personally find it to be ridiculous. I mean, comedy natural lampoons ridiculous, right? That a bad guy has hit over a fire hydrant and all these cops are around. Nobody's arresting him. This guy's outmanned like like one to up fifty. Like, like he's not surviving. He's going to get arrested. And the cops are just like, it's okay. Let's have a car through Murtaugh's house. Let's have fire hydrants go on. And let's have them duke it out. Let in the, the boys car. fight. Let them, let them fight. Let them fight. Let, they're just talking. They're just talking. Let them cool off. Right? Does Mr. Joshua think, though I get hyped about this, is because it's so dis – I mean, if, if you were Mr. Joshua, do you think – I'm going to kick his butt and possibly kill him, and nothing will happen to me. The cops will go, whoopsie doopsie, and he can leave. <laughs> like, like this is a no-win situation. You'll never take me for, alive, copper. Right, and so for Mel off. Gibson, so I'm sitting here watching the movie. Your, your mouth is open. I'm sitting here watching the movie, and he's like, you want a shot of the title? Yes! Yes, because this is so stupid. Yes, or let's like, go. Yeah, because it just turned into fr the end of Friday for some reason, which yeah. we're going to be watching. Right. So then, you know, they do their struggle. They do their fight. Mr. Joshua gets a couple good shots. Uh, Riggs gets a couple good shots. Rich chokes him out, doesn't kill him. Riggs is bloody and bleeding. He's cuts all over his face. He's shirtless with his man chest exposed, right? Oh, right. And then Mr. Joshua... Steals a gun straight from Die Hard, which Die Hard comes out later, a year later, right? And they both had to go and point the guns at the camera to kill Mr. Joshua. And then they, what, they drive off into the sunset? They no. Hold they, and... they hold hands. They hold hands. Yeah. They have Christmas dinner together. Right. I believe this, uh, this, this friendship. Uh, you can make friends out of some weird situations. And I think that's one of the reasons why I like the trilogy. Because, like, these guys actually work well together, I think, as it's actors. Called, it's called trauma bonding, Jordan. It's when you and your coworkers become best friends because your workplace is so horrendous. Well, how do Eric and I become friends? You're not coworkers. Are we, though? <laughs> no. I mean... This is not a, a job, right? No. Are you getting paid for this? Did I not know about that? No. Where's my check? Shoot. <laughs> um, I got to tell you before we get into popcorn rating, um, the sequel. Do you know who the villains are in the sequel, Sarah? I know I know absolutely nothing about the sequels. I thought there were five movies. Eric corrected me. There's only four. Right. So the second movie, the villains are white, African, uh, diplomats. Yeah. Oh, South African. Yes, uh, Southern okay. African. And the bad South, guy, South African, Jordan. South, it's South, a country. South, sorry, South Africa. And, and the bad guy always says when Riggs and Murtaugh tries to come at him, he's he always wings a piece of paper. And he's like diplomatic immunity. You can't do of anything course. to me, diplomatic immunity. And um, so there's a lot of the uh, 
Like there was a subplot in the sequel about uh, about the uh, oh, what was that, Eric? Uh, triad? Well, not the triad. Yakuza. The part? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Uh, the apartheid. The apartheid was a subplot. Oh, oh yeah. Apartheid. And uh, the bad guys rig a bomb to Murtaugh's toilet. <laughs> so Murtaugh sits on a toilet and he goes to wipe, and then it says bomb or boom or whatever. Yeah, that was in Last Action Hero, right? Right, but yes. okay. but he can't get up because when right. he gets up, then it explodes. explodes. Right. So okay. the whole that was a whole big thing, and then you find out that the henchman of the villain in the sequel is the guy that was paid to uh, put a hit on Riggs, thought it was Riggs in the car, but it was Riggs' wife. <gasps> doop, doop. Who was pregnant? Who was pregnant. The third movie, Riggs Finds Love. And who? Who is uh, it? Uh, what's her name? Renee Here. Russo. Renee Russo. Oh. And the villain is a renegade ex-cop who buys hollow point bullets to kill cops but the greatest thing is that he is buying land out in the country and building uh suburb houses that's that's the plot okay. right eric that's that's the plot of three yeah man and I, I, joe I, th- pesci's in it joe pesci's in the sequel and in the and then yeah. the third one oh. joe pesci. Okay. yeah he's in four as well too oh yeah joe the pesci- game's all here Joe Pesci comes in on the second one because he's a money launderer that does money laundering for the South Africans. He was the comic relief, the the wise or the, the smart mouth kind of. Well, you already, we already know, right? And he and he swears a lot, and you know he gets mad about Subway. That's in the sequel. Plays a very Joe Pesci character. Yeah, yeah, he gets he gets all mad about everything, and then he goes blonde in the third movie. Yeah. Okay. And then the and then the fourth movie is 1998, and this is where we get Jet Li as the bad guy, Chris Rock is the new young cop, and uh, Murtaugh's daughter's pregnant by a mystery man, uh, Riggs and Renee Russo. Uh, she's now pregnant, and we're waiting for the women to give birth at the same time, and we find out da 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 the mystery father is Chris Rock, you know, and. The end of the whole movie is the women give birth to their babies, and the doctor takes a picture, and they end with "We're family," and you know, why can't we be friends? Why can't we are we? family? Yeah. yeah, they end in a birdcage. So you yeah. got to show with the sequels. Do I? Yeah, I'm good not watching the sequels. I have a limited amount of time in my life right now. I'd rather watch other movies. <laughs> TV shows. I think the first many one other was, things was important enough just because again, out of out of a lot of the movies, I would be curious. I'm sure there's a college class somewhere that shows like the most parodied movies, and I'm sure it's going to be some sort of Hitchcock movie or like North by Northwest, y- you know, something that that kind of like airplane scene, right? Uh, or like a Psycho shower. But Lethal Weapon gets parodied a lot, a oh, yeah. lot, a lot, and the, yeah. it, it's. It's defined its own gen, you know. It's its own buddy cop thing. I don't know if this was the start of it because you had other like TV cop movie or TV cop. Starsky and Hutch was like one, right? That kind of comes. Chips. Yeah, where there's there's two buds on the beat, kind of doing their thing, and this is not the first maybe to do it, but it it's a generational movie. It, yeah, it this had, is generational. Yeah, you know, the saxophone and the electric guitars. It had. It had the blue jeans and the snakeskin boots. It had the hair for everybody, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. The mustache. Yeah. It it had what movies like the other guys are making fun of. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, best yeah. parody of this, I think, to date is going to be Always Sunny in Philadelphia and, <laughs> and how they did this movie. It, only because they include the blackface. Right. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> she, oh that was that was one of the biggest eye rolls from a wife I've <laughs> ever seen in my life, and the biggest eye roll for a wife goes to Sarah. Thank you, thank you. I will gladly accept this award. <laughs> the biggest eye roll. God, that was that was better than Gina's. Um, <laughs> I've already made Gina eye roll twice this morning. Um, 
Yeah, no, this, this if you movie get an eye roll, was... it's going to be from Always Sitting, Always Sitting in Philadelphia, I'd imagine. All right. No, I mean, like, like I, I, uh, just before we get into the pop ring with that, just kind of piggyback off of you, Eric. Yeah, I mean, this movie's a generational thing, right? I think, I mean, this movie came out when I was born, so I saw it 14 years later. You know, like, th- this was this was something that I thoroughly enjoyed. This was like this was like the R-rated movies that were R-rated but not hardcore R-rated. You know what I mean? It wasn't like a scary horror flick. You know, it was R-rated because there were some boobs and some swearing. Well, and. I God think God. also because of the age of like the '80s, especially the late '80s, uh, no, early '80s had a lot of it too. It was a lot of action hero gun porn. It was a lot right. of X forces, ops, special operations, government kicking in the door with the big old gun, boom, 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 uh, killing the bad guys. Bad guys can't shoot, which happens right. in this movie as well too. There's a moment where Murtaugh is in the desert. In the desert. Okay, there's nothing. He's just running, and these guys all have Uzis. They have semi-automatic, uh, automatic weapons, and they're all hitting dirt around them. Well, you tell me because the stormtroopers were told to not hit their target, it, it, that they can't hit them. It's like I don't understand that, especially because we're talking had had this whole thing before about oh well when I see a bad guy just hit him in the leg, disable him. You tell me that, yeah. that these special ops guys couldn't do the same, it, 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 take out the foot. So Murtaugh is not running away, especially because you're going to torture him later. What? You shoot him anyway. Right. I would. I would. And also, why would you bring a smoke grenade to uh, to a gunfight? Literally, right? I oh, mean, it's part of the part of the plan, I guess. For that was a terrible, terrible plan. Yeah. Terrible plan. Yes, it was, but it but it it worked at the end, I guess. If popcorn ratings, I am torn between a medium and a large because this movie is nostalgia. Um. Do I give a large just because of nostalgia? You know what? Yes. Because if you love action movies, like, you know, like teens today, right? Teenage boy comes up and is like, hey, you know, I'm looking for some uh, old dad movies. What should I watch? Predator, Lethal Weapon, Die Hard. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, this is this is a part of that conversation, right? This movie has spawned a lot of parodies. Uh, sometimes this movie and the sequels become a parody of itself. Uh, but this very first Lethal Weapon movie is, I think, an 80s classic. I don't know if people actually feel that way. I think it is. I think if you've never seen it, you should at least see this one. So therefore, I'm giving it uh, a large. Eric, what is your popcorn rating for Lethal Weapon? I, mm, I, I enjoy it, and I would vouch that it's generational, especially because... In cinema, you have these eras where, in the 80s, a lot of the movie covers were the main star doing the side profile or, like, the quarter turn profile, looking into the camera, title in the bottom, and then maybe some sort of effect in the back. But that's basically a lot of your your 80s. Uh, 70s was usually them in an action pose and anim- drawn. It was not often was it a picture. It was kind of drawn. But in the 90s, a lot of it was elemental. It was a lot of it was the scene, you, like Twister. You, you get to see kind of two people running away from the Twister. Or Independence Day. You get you know what that movie cover is like. And so a lot of the movies right. in the 90s were of a landscape or of a, a, a scene of the movie or kind of the situation. This movie defines a, the 80s a generation because it's got the two people in the buddy which we're doing a whole retrospective on uh, the buddies comedies of them both doing the quarter turn looking into the camera like buddies do the gun up and uh, ready for action i think in the same part of evil dead this movie started off on a serious note but then started to get more and more parody as the franchise continues just because sure. they're they know that this is fun. What are two cops doing dealing with such an international drug trade? <laughs> it, you know, and like you're telling me that no one else caught on to this thing's been going on for years, and that Murtog, the one guy, just happened to stumble upon it because his buddy was just feeling down one day. He's like, "Oh yeah, they killed my daughter. Why'd you go kill him? Um, oh yeah, by the way, I've been doing this for years, for twenty years, <laughs> twenty years." <laughs> You want some eggnog? You know, it just, it's just like that's what it was. That's that's what gave it away. Um, but you know, everything's so far fetched in the movie that it's just kind of silly and, and fun. I don't know. Right. Uh, 
I, I want to say large just because of the the weight that it holds culturally. It's not a good movie on on paper. Uh, I don't I don't want to ruin your parade there, but I actually written by the same the same writer Shane Black did the Nice Guys. I would say that's a way better written movie. We may be reviewing that for this series. Yeah, I would say that's a far better written movie. The dynamic between the two are fantastic. The, the way that it captures the time of, what was it, the 70s in that one? Or is that 60s? Right. Uh, 70s. I thought that was a, a really great, too. This just seems very much more kind of cartoony of the 80s. So, okay. What I, are you going to give it? I, 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 guess, I guess I have to give it a large just because, again, yes, of how how often I've seen this. Yes, uh, in other inspired works. Okay. I give it a large, Eric gives a large, Sarah, two questions. First question is a short one between Eric and I, who is Merton? Who is Rick's? <laughs> um, good question. I, Ooh. I mean, let's be honest here. I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> I feel like if this was 10 years ago, yeah, I might. I, I I don't know. I, I mean, don't. it's it's obvious. It's I don't obvious. think this is obvious at all. Yeah, oh, Eric's you're clearly, right. Eric's Murtaugh. Yeah, Eric's. I mean, obviously, yeah. Eric. Eric is more refined. I'm Eric's too old more, for this shit. Eric's more down to he earth. He says that a lot. Right. He's he's like a year or two older than me. Right. You know. He but... he really um, draws from his inner black man. Correct. He has a two story house. What the hell, Jordan? Are you really that crazy? Are right. you really Look that at me. crazy, Jordan? Look at me. How many times do I call Eric about freaking out? You gotta <laughs> calm it down. You gotta calm it down, Jordan. Yeah. Right? Eric's the voice of reason. Right. Come on, it was obvious. So, Bats, Sarah. Obviously. What is your popcorn rating for Lethal Weapon? I'm gonna give it a solid medium. Um, I don't have the nostalgia, um, you know, uh, boom, bump. I think that you guys can give it because I this was my first time seeing it um, sure. all the way through. Uh, it's a solid 80s cop movie. You know, um, there's drugs. It's in L.A. You know, black guy, white guy, uh, you know, kind of silly. Whoa. You know, I I don't have a lot to say about it. Like, it's it's a solid movie, but uh, it's, it's not one that I'm going to sit down and be like, oh, man, Lethal Weapon's on. I'm going to watch that again. Would you try watching the sequel just to see if you want to continue? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> Maybe in like 10 years when I have, you know, time again. Yeah. Uh, but not right now. Fair enough. If, if Fair I'm enough. flipping through the channels and I see this on, let's say the movie started, you know, 15, 20 minutes in, it's probably going to stay on. Right. Like just. Yeah, I might watch it in the background, but I'm not going to sit down and watch it. Just oh. be like, man, I really want to watch Lethal Weapon right now. Of course. Right. But if any yeah. of the sequels are on, I'm probably going to pass those. Yeah, I mean, like, they they jump the shark very quick with the sequel. The sequel opens with the Looney Tunes theme song. Seriously, it does. We we were just watching Looney Tunes this morning. Yeah, during during a car chase, it opens with that. So okay. quickly, the director is showing us that it's Looney Tunes era. Well, this is episode one of our uh, nostalgia series, right? Uh, this is our buddy series. These these go by quick. I don't know if you guys have paid attention to that. This is like our fourth time doing this, right? And we sit here, we plan it out, we pick the movies that we want to pick, and then we do it once a month, and it goes quick. So I'm excited to see what the rest of the series is going to bring, and I always want to announce them, but Sarah says don't. So Are we doing I, any more Shane Black? He, he does... Yeah, nice to, guys. It's just nice guys? Yeah, that's the only one we picked. There was a bunch. Remember, Honestly, we, had we did that. List. We did Last Action Hero. So this be our third. That would be our third Shane Black movie. Shane Black has the golden microphone. Yeah, it certainly does. I guess. Yes, we give a golden microphone out to uh, people that we review three times. Ooh. <laughs> it's very hard to give them a microphone that's golden when we don't know their address. Uh <laughs> Shane Black, I know you're listening. Just uh, go ahead and at us on Instagram. Jordan's going to do all the socials. 
Everybody, thank you so much for listening to this most recent episode of Movie Guys Podcast. Check us out at moviegeyspodcast at podbean.com or download this episode wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, but we'll be back next Thursday for another awesome episode. Eric is here. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a good night. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hi. Don't get loud with me again. Don't act like you can't hear me. <laughs> you want to know how to make 40 bucks in 15 minutes by doing nothing? Uh, how's that? So the people that live next door to me uh, fired their lawnscaper, if you will. Uh-huh. And for about three weeks now, the grass is... You could is... say that, that they... Cut him, huh? Go ahead. <laughs> so um, the grass for the past three weeks has gotten about knee high. My height, and I'm six one, so everybody's listening can kind of figure that out. And um, everybody around the general area has complained to them and said that if you don't get this done by like Monday, we're calling the village. It's going to cost you like 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. because you know this is ridiculous so uh they're moving out because they don't feel like anybody likes them sure true story and yesterday my wife was talking to him and one of them said to my wife i need somebody to mow this lawn and gina says my husband will do it and i look at gina like what and then i look at the homeowner and i said well and and then the homeowner said, I just need the front done, which is as big as my yard. And uh, I said, all right. She goes, pay 40 bucks. All right, then. I didn't even, I didn't even, I didn't even say, no, I didn't say what? I just perked up like a squirrel, like, mm -hmm. and just got my tractor, mowed it twice because it was so thick. So afterwards, that's what she said. Um, mm -hmm. I go inside the house. And I said, hey, honey, did we get our money? Because she was talking to him. And she goes, yes. It was a it was a check for $40. And they didn't know how to spell my name, so they just wrote my name in it. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. I'm going to cash this tomorrow, see what happens. If this is Watch that bounce. Mm-hmm.